might not have happened this year, but uh, it, it would have happened one way or another. But John did it at his organization, and I think a lot of users really appreciate that. So I'll turn it over to thank you. Mr. Tool. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here, Sam. And uh, we've had a special relationship. Uh, Salam has worked with us for a couple of years. I've been here. I've been here two years myself in the Valley. And it's like Jim just said, uh, this is where the stuff is. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we're here and not in Boston. But we'll kind of go through a lot of that history for you, give you a sense of, of what's happening, what has happened, uh, through really 25 years of trying to preserve artifacts and stories and information, which really is our mission. Um, I want to highlight some of the organizational implications we have because I think many of you. Uh, are going through some of that same kind of stuff. We are also a 501c3. Um, we have to be careful with some of the things that we say, so I'll be a little bit uh, more political perhaps than uh, the Jim was, was able to. Um, but on the other hand, I can certainly be frank, I can tell you that my background is electrical engineering, computer science. I've spent uh, 28 years in research, and, uh, also with the government and ARPA before I came here two years ago. So it's an interesting transition, but a really fun one to enable a lot of people, hobbyists, professionals, and others to really make something great, uh, not just for the family, <coughs> but for international computing history. Uh, the current operation I'll talk about, um, again, that's really about bringing communities together, building a living organization for the long term. And I want to highlight long term here because, you know, as, as Jim was just talking about all this stuff that just keeps coming in in huge quantities, although we have an unbelievable crunch on warehouse space as well. We're very selective about the kind of things we want. But even so, we're trying to preserve those types of things in a manner that can be really living and dynamic. I hope many of you yesterday perhaps spent the time to go down the block and, and kind of see what the Computer History Museum's early visible storage exhibit area is. If you haven't, um, and you're not going to DigiBarn, but I really encourage you to go to DigiBarn, um, come on over there today too. Um, and we'll open every other, uh, every week. And future plans are really exciting because we now own a new building. Of course, we're on shore long. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a sense of what that's all about. Uh, standard mission, the preservation uh, of artifacts and stories. Uh, unfortunately, after I speak for about 20 minutes or so, we do today. Spicer, who's our exhibits curator, my favorite exhibits curator. Unfortunately, I'm going to tell that I is the only exhibits curator we have. Uh, he works for Mike Williams, who's our head curator. But uh, Mike Dag has been with us for many, many years, and we'll give you a sense of some of the content of what our collections is, and talk a little bit about uh, the 1620 restoration project. And uh, you can see the 1620 across the street. A um, couple of things I want to point out is that we're sort of, uh, uh, we started in Boston 25 years ago. Okay, some of you yesterday pointed out to me, gee, are, are you associated with it? Well, Boston Computer Museum doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the artifacts were moved out here in 1996, uh, beginning in 1996, and completed in about 1999. So now we've got probably one of the world's largest collections of artifacts. Not all of which you're going to see because another building just across the street here is just full floor to ceiling with things. Uh, things that we've been storing for many, many years and really <clears throat> building in growth as time goes on. And these are the five collections that the Dang is going to talk about, so I'm not going to get into too much of that. I thought you'd enjoy a little bit of those. Now we're going to try that. Did anybody hear that? Good enough. Move the mic a little closer, maybe. Right on top of it. This is Gordon Bell, of course, he looked pretty young there. Um, he's aged a little bit, but his energy hasn't changed one bit. So this was in 79, it was called the Computer Museum. The Digital Computer Museum is when Ken Olson and Gordon actually cut the ribbon in uh, Maynard. Take a look at what the commercials were in 1984. 
Another watch journey with computers. Adam and the Basin Museum. The Computer Museum. The Computer Museum. The computer museum. There was something in it for everyone. And this was almost 20 years ago. Now listen how prophetic the statement of Apple's been. Space Center that focused on space technology. It's huge. It's built for one uh, dirigible. There's land in here for a university complex. Carnegie Mellon using Santa Cruz uh, have been NASA research partners. We initially had three acres of land up here that we were going to build from scratch, building uh, here at NASA Research Park. And then it was a uh, commercial enterprise around, wrapped around it that we built. This whole Park would be built probably between five and 20 years. We were ready to roll, so when the economy sort of tanked, uh, we decided this was a great opportunity to look around. And that's sort of what our story is um, in a lot of different things. And this is a little uh, where we changed our logo, we changed our name of the Computer History Museum. This rolls into video. And that's what we've lived. Rather than cramped cramp quarters as things expanded and changed over, over the last two years, and I've been through the last two years, um, there's a lot of things that happened. Now, this is an example of John Hennessy bringing his class over to Stanford, um, giving, a, giving a tour, Dave Babcock, one of our docents. There's a lot of very active program, and that's we're really trying to expand uh, the docent training part process and what all these things actually mean. And the biggest thing, of course, is our new home, 1401 Shoreline Boulevard, uh, one exit up, if you will. 101. These are some pictures of it. Uh, 119,000 square feet. Um, we chose to let's get started, let's do something right away. And these are some pictures of what it could be. These are pictures of what it is actually. Pictures of the lobby. Uh, we're going to put an auditorium in there. We have a world class lecture program. Uh, as, as you know, I'll talk a little bit about that right now. And I hope you all can spend some time uh, seeing what the next lectures uh, they, they come to. We get about three or four hundred people, but this is really something that we can expand into uh, in two different phases, and we're pretty excited as well as both seminars, lectures, um, and really more fundamentally put a visible presence of what computer history is all about. What was the former use of the building? The initially was built in 1994 by SGI, it's owned by SGI as an international sales and marketing headquarters. Okay, we sold about a year and a half ago to Carlisle Properties and what so it was really, truly a great location, great building. Now, that's the physical side of the museum, the one that really counts, of course, the people, and, and all the things and activities that go on around that, uh, 
plus all the things that are happening day in and day out. And I just want to highlight some of those things. Uh, we've got an unbelievable board of trustees. I, mean, I think that's something else I would strongly recommend anybody really think through carefully and really get the organizational process together. Get those supporters behind you, not only financially, but mentally, physically, and all the energy. We really have that, I believe, unlike any one other, other organization I've ever met. Uh, I personally came here and was committed after I met a lot of trustees, a lot of the committed staff, which has really made a difference. Um, volunteers, uh, Dag and Pop about the 1620 restoration, a whole team that worked a year and a half restoring the 1620 in a very museum, unique museum way. I think mean, just the kind of commitment. Uh, as well as learning experience and camaraderie that really, really we're trying to build overall. And in addition, uh, we have an incredible lecture series. Uh, this is just a fall lecture series that goes on. Uh, we, we move this around sometimes. We hold it in this building. Uh, we had uh, Pioneers of Venture Capital <coughs> September 30th. A sellout crowd. We had two people away to the fire market. We had more people in the building. Uh, then we basically have a uh, a uh, reception sometimes over at over at our our, our visible storage exhibit area. Coming up, Chuck Eschke, John Warnock, November 12th, Steve Wozniak, December 10th. And we just this past week had a fellows award banquet. And um, we were honoring four new fellows, which is a program that we've started since 1987. Um, it was really spectacular, about 400 people down this event in San Jose Fairmont. Um, Geshke and Warnock for, for their contributions to the building, Carver Mead. Who was microelectronics contributions and John Cock, the inventor of risk, and who has passed away. We normally give these awards to people that are living. Uh, John had accepted, uh, unfortunately, he passed away. And that's part of our preservation mission to try to get those stories um, as early as we can. There's a lot else that's happening, and uh, some of this is sort of a challenge to, to help us because uh, really I think that the roots. Of technology really are the kind of energy and synergy that are in this room and the kind of people think that you have done as well. Um, you don't hear much about the cycle museum, but we have in the background cooking plans to really expose and unveil a large kind of cycle museum to include a lot of different things, not just new kind of exhibits, but complementary kind of information that can make this information available to the world and walk through in very serious and exciting ways. Yes? Yeah, um, Lectures online because uh, I can't make it to all the lectures, they're all related. Absolutely, and, and I have to apologize that we've been a little bit behind on that. Uh, we've, we've got some lectures, we've got two or three people now that are totally involved in the coding, and they should be available to everybody at any time. And probably within a week or so after the after particular lecture. There's a little bit of editing you want to do to clean things up to make it more more uh, fresh for people, but that, that doesn't take long. So we've got a team now in place to do that. So we definitely will be doing that. We kick off an oral history, actually a video history project uh, with some of our trustees who themselves are pioneers of the time. Um, classic software preservation, Greedy Bush, you know, a few people have, have, he and I have collaborated in building a community of people that are interested in preserving the classic software. And this raises a lot of intellectual questions too. You know, what is it? Uh, what do you want to say? And how do you want to say it? Can you say it? And who should you say it? And what value is going to have in the future? So from a museum point of view, it's not a, a, an easy question to answer, but this is the community kind of a process we're trying to kick off. And we're really big on prototyping what our future might be from the museum side. So which makes us, and I believe, somewhat unique in the museum world. At the same time, we, we want to have our roots in the preservation activities. Uh, so there's, there's always this tension between what is classic museum kind of activity versus what is new, exciting, just get it done kind of world. And I think it's that spectrum of where you draw the line and boundary that becomes our challenge. And I can say one thing, we're, we're doing things a little bit differently. At the same time, you've got to know that if you want things to exist, you know, 20, 100 years from now, you've got to think like that a little bit. So there's this hybrid approach that we're trying to pioneer and prototype things that start to make sense for now and the future. We have some big events. Um, Deck World was something we did about a year ago. We're doing something called Apple World. What are these? Well, these are, there's a, there's a really a collaboration of people that have worked on a given product line, Digital Equipment Corporation. So we brought in a couple hundred people. Uh, there was 100 people from outside the valley, 100 people from the valley last year. It was probably part reunion, part oral history, part, you know, visceral reaction to seeing each other and telling their stories, which we recorded on video tape. 
some of which you can see on the uh, on the website today. We're doing the same thing for Apple. We've got an unbelievable response of people that are already interested. And this becomes a mechanism for us to, to really focus certain kinds of activities and get those oral histories, get that history and stories recorded in a way, in the context, I think, that things have really happened to complement the real facts that we know. Um, the collection, I believe, that for DAG volunteer programs, um, we have really turned the gain up on creating new docents uh, in the sense of, you know, what it takes to do that, the training materials, it's pretty exciting. I think when you come over for a tour anytime, uh, the team of people we have, uh, I'm really, really proud of. And we're expanding on that, so when we move into our new building, we can increase our hours of openness and everything else. And they can become part of this whole process, because I hope any of you will try to do so as well. Um, gosh, health and everything, jeez. I mean, our volunteers are really the soul of what we have. Lee Courtney, the man who's, who's manning the, uh, the video camera, is our volunteer coordinator. But I, but I have to say, Lee has spent more hours than you could ever dream of. And in addition, raised a new family, spent a lot of time with, with new companies, new positions. But it's that kind of commitment and his ability to be able to do that as long as it's well many other people in this room, I think that, that really has made a lot of it happen for this particular museum that I'm really honored to be, be the executive director of. And we got collaborations all over the place with the Smithsonian, Charles Babbage Institute, key areas, Digibarn, we're talking groups of how we can really be more tightly coupled in a lot of different interesting and exciting ways. I think there are organizations from the world-class museums, London Museum of Science, to institutions and organizations, to serious collecting communities, which we hope we can encourage you to do what you've been doing at the same time. Think about what happens, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now with your collection. Perhaps we should work a relationship now that will start to make sense. And that's what we are doing with two or three different groups that we really think are going to be important for the future, and they, and they keep track over time what's going to be important. And, and obviously, there's people who really care and enjoy the beauty. There's, there's, no, uh, there's no substitute for having fun in this. Let's see. Now, even though we've got a new building, the fun has really just yet to begin. And what I want to show you is how you now move into exhibit design. Now, this is a little walk through, fly through of, of this particular kind of mock-up models that we have over 126 of how we might exhibit things uh, in the future. And it covers a lot of space. Uh, it covers how you do network, how you do software, how you do processors, how you do the timelines of history. And we've actually done an incredible job of laying out what the timelines of history, and, and we have curators across the country uh, looking at how these things might start to feel about how they can come alive for people. And just to give you an idea, I mean, it's there's there's a lot of work that goes on. I mean, both identifying what the artifacts are, how you might think of what's important in errors of time, what you may start to do for proactive collecting today for the next 10 or 15 years. And this is all part of what, what we're trying to really make happen. And to give you a sense of time, space, of how these things kind of come together, this is, I mean, these, these diagrams, by the way, change every five minutes of discussion that we have, quite frankly. But this is a layout of what shoreline might be for us, you know, three to five years from now. You know, what we're going to do is probably move our staff in in December. We're going to have a visible public presence in May. We've got some structural changes to be made on the second floor. But beyond that, we've got some more fundraising to do. We're talking about raising you know, tens of millions of dollars more put into the endowment to keep us solid as rock, at the same time, complete our capital campaign. But the second floor will be very interesting because we'll have about 21,000 square feet of timeline gallery. Because I think mean, that's going to be what's really going to be our showcase in terms of you know, walking through the history of, of, of the world uh, over periods of time and decades. And that's going to be kind of what our what our Fort K is going to be. We're going to have an auditorium, about 7,200 square feet, from plus or minus. It'll be where we'll have our lectures. We'll do this pretty earlier, in three to five year time frame. But it'll give us a chance to get people there, to understand the whole events, both from we do dinners there, we do all kinds of kinds of things uh, in that space. And then we'll have theme galleries up there too, about 12,000 square feet. Theme galleries will be focused on storage. We've got a whole team of 
people in the disc industry that kind of banded together and put you know all the timelines as well as the events of what the disc industry has done, this trends and everything else. So that be, can be translated to a really interesting exhibit. Uh, software will be one of those exhibits. We're not sure all the things how we can do that, but there's an incredible number of ideas of how you can make that stuff live. From working activities, look at different kinds of environments, to what are the real things over time that are going to be the most important. Um, on the first floor, we'll have a large, we'll put the administration there, all about 70, 100 square feet. Uh, we'll have a visible storage. I mean, one thing we don't want to lose here is, is the feeling that uh, you, know, you are with these particular um, pieces of equipment, all the artifacts, the ephemeral things that we have. So uh, we're going to do something that's going to be different than what you see over there at 126 today, but it's going to be the same kind of experience because of different learning modalities that you really want to have. And this area will be sort of flexible. We'll do this on a rapid turnaround kind of a basis, turnaround being you know, maybe one or two years kind of a thing. And in that sense, it could be computers in art, it could be computers in a particular technology, it could be computers in whatever it happens to be. It's really highlight where computing history is going now into the future. And let me just wrap up really quickly. I want to turn it over today. Spicer is kind of, you know, you know what, what you folks can do. Um, first, I hope you all have had a chance to visit us a uh, block away. And I think this is a great opportunity not only to, to help and support BCF, which we strongly do, uh, but to really have a really community spirit of what we're really trying to do together. And secondly, um, spread the word. Um, we'd like to overperform rather than say a lot of things and then not do anything. So, so I think we're in really the growth phase right now. It really is going to make a difference. And I think, um, I think we're ready to really tell the story to a lot of people where we're going to go. The next time you're in town, uh, we'll be probably having tours of the new building. We're not going to do that today because I think there's some other things that you really want to go see. And become a volunteer. I mean, just contact us at any time. You've got the website. Um, become a volunteer. I'm mean, just a call for any kind of people that are interested in computer history. Become a volunteer. You become a docent. Um, storytellers for us, help us put the websites together. There's lots and lots of opportunities and, and really support any of the organizations who really care. So maybe I'll take just two or three questions myself now and then turn it over to Dag and tell you a little bit more about the details of the collection and what's really behind. Yes, sir. How many are on the page staff? How many are active volunteers? Sure, good question. We, we, uh, let me show you the area of growth. We're about four. We had about four paid staff about uh, two years ago. We're about 18 right now. Roughly about 22 people total time. Uh, volunteers, what's the latest count bets? 150 uh, That's my wife, by the way, back there. I I, uh, I broke her into the company for the stuff, too. Good question. Yes, sir. Are you planning on having a research facility? Yes, I should, I, should I should have focused a little bit more on that. I mean, our, our goal is not to be a science center, just K through 12 kind of a science center. Our goal is really to be kind of high school and up and a family unit experience as far as what you visit. And the back end research activities that would be associated with that is what are really our goal happens to be. So between the web, between the archive collection, and the artifacts themselves, uh, we do hope to sponsor internships and those kinds of things in conjunction with local and any universities that uh, we get a place to be part of the organization. Excellent. I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't want that to go over the top. Anything else I can answer? Anything? How do you decide what stories to tell? Really tough. Um, I think I think here's here's the nugget of really the difficult part of the question. Okay, because first of all, many of the things in our industry change on you know, microsecond notice as opposed to every ten years. And years is typically the boundary where you say that that becomes history. It gives you enough time to let the dust settle a little bit. So I think number one, we're going to have a curatorial voice for the museum. Um, my employees who will be able to write that, integrate that the best that we can. It'll be our curatorial voice at one level. And then we're going to have two or three other layers of, of curatorial process, some of which down the bottom are going to be, hey, any one of you can not only have information available for the search, but basically will, will be available. Now, I, I can't predict, nor will I try to predict, what will be on the history books. I don't think that's our job. But I think our job is to preserve the information that we can and make that available for the researchers that, that uh, we were just talking about before. So over the longer term, time will tell what really turns out to be written. At the same time, we're going to be very aggressive in trying to tell a coherent, consistent story 
if you will, of things that are interesting, challenging, and are representative of the overall thing at the museum level. And I don't know that any other way to do that. If anybody has suggestions today, and I, uh, please let us let us know. Yes. What steps are you taking to protect your artifacts and such? Uh, well, that's a great transition because I'm going to let, let, <laughs> we'll let the curator talk about that. And that's a very important one because right now it's pretty bad. Well, it's good here in California. It's good here in Northern California, um, but it's pretty bad in these kind of warehouses. And part of the step here is a tremendous step toward that end to protect not only our, our, our multimedia artifacts, but many other things. And that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So let me introduce Dag Spicer, if I may. And uh, I said my favorite exhibit curator, so. I just have a couple announcements, quick announcements to make. Um, the uh, Digit Barn. Okay. Well, I want to say how uh, nice it is to be here at BCF. And uh, first of all, just thanks Sam for putting these on year after year, especially under some really uh, trying circumstances uh, last year, and uh, just in general, putting this all together himself. I like to think of him as the uh, Che Guevara of computer history. <laughs> 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 the time of the gorilla, grassroots. I uh, guess people out here doing really cool things. You just have to have a look out in the, uh, in the exhibit room there to see the quality of exhibits. Not only the high technical standards, but the uh, great aesthetic uh, presentation of exhibits and uh, explanatory text that goes with these machines. So uh, again, it's really nice to be here. And today I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, artifacts and uh, the degree to which we intervene in artifacts, how, how the museum addresses the, the different people that, uh, that interact with our artifacts. Okay, so the title of my talk is from, uh, okay. uh, from, from Data to Dust, the Mind and Balance Between Stewardship and Education. Just a very quick aside, stewardship is uh, sort of a generic museum term which relates to uh, the care and feeding of artifacts, and education is, of course, how you interpret those artifacts for people that visit them. There's uh, a spectrum between preservation and use of artifacts, so on the one hand, you have, uh, on your left, you have a warehouse where you, uh, uh, like the Bible says, find your candle under a bushel where you, like the end, end scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, you just put everything in boxes and put it in a huge warehouse and no one ever looks at it. That's definitely what we're not worried about. On the other hand, you have use, which is where you uh, let people interrogate artifacts physically, let, let them plug things in, desolder things, and that's also not what we're about. Uh, and the conflict arises, and I know a lot of you who actually bring machines back to life deal with this, because uh, there are many deep philosophical uh, arguments you can have for, for both sides of the coin. One is, I want to keep this as pristine as possible, the other is, well, you know, if you have a mute object that's never on, and that's never used, it sort of fails uh, in addition that in the purpose of having that artifact around, you want people to use it. Sam, especially, and a lot of you also believe that there's no point in having a beautiful, uh, a beautiful corpse, if you like, of a machine that no one can Bruce, especially Bruce Neighbor. So, and the ironic thing is, even during the days of uh, when the machine was used, even then people were doing things that they probably shouldn't be. And you know, you count at least three different things that are wrong in this picture. That anyone in a machine room uh, who's ever worked in a machine room would be very surprised. The woman smoking. There's no other one drinking right on top of the console, and then there's another cup right here. All disasters waiting to happen. Um, so anyway, that's those are the two uh, poles that we try to uh, skirt and avoid. We try to stay some, you know, somewhere in the middle, maybe a little bit towards the preservation side. But uh, our user community, and there probably are others besides this, but these these are the top five that I uh, six that I uh, came up with. Students. In, of all ages, we get uh, you know eight-year-olds from Malaysia sending us emails, uh, those that those that can, um, about uh, who invented the internet. Very broad questions where um, 
you know, we have to come up with answers for school, typically the next day. <laughs> 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 so we have intellectual property specialists, like a lawyer at law firms. And in fact, we use the fees that we charge the lawyers uh, to subsidize a lot of the educational missions. So, for example, a law firm undertaking contract research with us has to become a corporate member, which is $1,000 a year, and then we're, we bill out our time at 125 an hour. And they're more than happy to pay that, and do not blink an eye at those rates. And even though you know the museum is a lot of business to make money, this helps you underwrite some of the education and outreach mission missions at the museum. So we can answer the six-year-old in Malaysia and not you know have to worry about uh, whether or not that's a, a profit center. Uh, historians, obviously, we have uh, grad students and people, postgraduate students who come to uh, browse our archives. And get a lot of the manuals that you just won't find anywhere else in the world. As you know, there's a lot of this stuff is near print material, uh, really bizarre manuals or schematics or wiring diagrams that nobody keeps, and at least of all the companies, they, they just don't seem to hang on to them. So we collect that with great vigor. Uh, another user community are computer people, uh, WAs and CS uh, types, who just want to learn more about their profession and their, their disciplinary identity by coming to the museum and walking through visible storage, for example. Right there, you've got 100 years of computer history in an area you know, of, of about uh, 8,000 square feet. So it's very compact. Uh, how many people here have gone over and seen the space? Okay, that's good, about 60% of you. Uh, another user community is Hollywood. Uh, we do a lot of uh, work with uh, the Learning Channel, uh, MSNBC, uh, people doing movies for Hollywood. Uh, Fire in the Valley, that movie with uh, Noah Wiley and uh, every other guy was, they, they did shot some footage here, and they usually want working equipment. And news organizations. Uh, when uh, the election last year, with all the, all the weird voting uh, machine breakdowns, that was a huge, uh, our phones were ringing up for, that was two years ago. Chad. Two years. Chad. 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 They wanted to know the history of Chad, where it came from. <laughs> 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 and uh, so, you know, we had a lot of news organizations coming to the museum, or uh, someone like me or John or someone else would, uh, you know, sit in front of a uh, punch card machine and uh, explain a bit about the, about the, uh, the problems. Yeah? In the intellectual property, you mentioned the research that you do. Uh, does it have to be in specific fields the museum's interested in, or is it general? Well, we, we, there's a bit of back and forth before a, a agreement is entered into. Uh, in other words, do we have the resources that they're looking for? So we just, if they're interested in the history of that projector, for example, well, we can pretty well say no, we're, we, we're not in a projector museum. But if there's some, some subtle, they're very, very wily people, if I mean to say that. Um, they often want you to do research, but not tell you enough to really be helpful, because that sort of gives away their plan. You know, it's a way these are very high profile cases usually. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars at stake, sometimes more. So I don't know if that answers your question. But the position we take is straightforward. I mean, you know, we're a public institution, the things we make available to anybody are available to anybody. And, and we said, come on, we look at it, we want to, we're not allocating our staff time other than the fact that the kind of things we typically do to anyone else in the US plus for us. And I want to keep it just at that level. Right, and uh, okay, so those are the user, user communities, that's what, I'm sorry, that's who, now what? We have five collections, uh, and I'm just taking the liberty of putting what form these come in after uh, Nicholas Negroponte's division, uh, at least he's the one I, I know of, you know, with add some bits, uh, you know, physical artifacts versus just ones and zeros. Of course, ones and zeros have to exist on a physical material level as well, but we'll just skirt that issue. So there's artifacts, software, camera, media, and photographs. I'll just step through these really quickly. Artifacts are pretty obvious. These are all from our collection. Um, Wozniak's blue box is the blue one. A, a German Enigma machine is used in World War II for encryption and decryption of uh, Nazi uh, army codes. And here's a uh, on the American side, the uh, 1961 the semi-automatic ground environment system, which was a 1960s era uh, uh, Star Wars program, in a sense. It sought to create a, a shield, an umbrella, over the continent of the United States. 
and uh, all computer control, and actually the limits of air traffic control are in this system. So there's huge amounts of history behind it, but uh, we'll just move along because uh, that's not the actual focus of the talk. But we have computers almost that can go inside you, like those little uh, upper, lower upper intestinal cameras that you can swallow. I'm trying to get as one to computers that you walk inside of, like Sage. So, software. We have about a gigabyte of historical software, and um, very strong in certain areas, such as uh, the deck stuff, because this museum had its root in digital equipment. We've really got some good deck. Uh, we're very strong in that. In fact, we have you know multiple multiple instances of almost every deck machine uh, made. Uh, whirlwind, the MIT Whirlwind computer, first machine to use core memory, and the first machine for which core memory was invented. The IBM 1620, that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, Multics, and PC OS based <coughs> applications were pretty strong in that. And the media challenges that we have, uh, and I thank uh, Al Passau and Eric Smith uh, for their help in this too, because um, there's really a whole world in the, in, in the issue of dead media and, and reading this and all stuff. So we have stuff from the Univac One Metal Tape. This weighs up to 20 pounds. It's just the size of my laptop there, but it's, it's metal, metallic tape. Uh, two DVDs, people give us stuff in all sorts of formats. You know? And uh, this is, I don't know if you can realize this, this platter here is actually being held by two people. It's three feet across, about a meter across. So we have no uh, illusions about reading that platter. But, uh, ephemera, buttons, t-shirts. Pens, tote bags, all the kind of stuff you get at Comdex or you know, whenever there's a product launch. There's a great book that a guy did on Apple t shirts and how he traced the history of Apple through its t shirts. And uh, so it's very significant, actually, that uh, history can be, those, those t shirts be, become mild, milestones and milepost in the development of the company. And they're not trivial at, trivial at, at all, even though they're kind of fun. Uh, you know, they're actually very important. They give you the uh, marketing and Often technical constraints that underlie a product, and especially the comp competition. And media, we have things like movies. If this works. Space as well. 
Uh, so Adams are here to stay, but to serve the museum's user communities and to meet the preservation goals of the museum, they can be digitized. And to me, and I'm pretty sure uh, John would agree that uh, you know, using the web and digitizing a lot of this stuff is the way that you both a help preserve the artifact by the fact that people are no longer interacting with it directly, but interacting with the simulacrum of it, and b actually reaching out to a much larger audience, which is that's. Face it, 99% of the museum visitors will be over the web. Not everyone will be looking at the physical objects uh, for that transcendental experience of actually being in front of, say, a Cray One or an Enigma machine, which is very, very cool. Um, but only if you can do that. So, uh, Skip the Mountain, kind of given the quantity of access to bits we collect, how do we cope? And the answer is volunteers. Uh, and I want to look at a specific uh, example, which is the IBM 1620 project. And uh, this was our first serious recon uh, reconstruction. And we did it, <coughs> took about 18 months, and we did it with a guy uh, who the project leader was Dave Babcock, who uh, was working at SGI in HP. He's, he's, he's around here, I don't know if you're today, but he's here yesterday. And this was just a wonderful, beautifully executed model for how you should intervene in an object. And museums are very uh, sort of skittish about opening up cases and, and resoldering things and adding, adding things on, taking things away because much like classic cars or you know collectors of any kind uh, like things to be in as original a condition as possible. You know, um, for example, if we get a case or a box for an artifact, sometimes that is of more interest than the artifact itself because the artifacts are easy to get. It's exactly like the old story of Barbie in a box. If you watch the Antiques Roadshow, you know, you've got a doll or a G.I. Joe, whatever your preference. Uh, you've got this doll, in it, or you've got one in a box, and one in the box is worth about 50 times more than one just alone is. Because boxes are ephemeral and they're the first things to get thrown out, it makes it much more rare. So, with the power of the 1620 project, 60% 60 of all electronic failures are power supply related. This machine had not been turned on in about 30, 30 years, 25 years. So it had been running the step up to about 1970. So um, we were meeting once, sometimes twice a month for a Saturday. It was a team of about five or six core people with about 25 virtual volunteers behind the scenes. And uh, so we really took our time with the power supplies. We, we knew that um, this is really where, this is obviously the first thing you have to, to work on, but also the most important. If you did something wrong here, you would get a torpedo of the entire project. You know, by not being very, very careful. So each power supply was carefully removed and tested, and in fact, two of them were bad. Like a lot of IBM equipment, um, this is a trans transistor-based machine, at multiple voltage levels, and also very complex sequencing. Things had to be turned on. Various power supplies had to be turned on in a certain order. So you can see here the very act that we used, and all the power supplies were removed. I think there were six, and tested separately. One of them had completely failed, and. Uh, so we, once we got that up, we turned the machine on and uh, we passed the smoke test, which was very uh, good. We, we very, once it did pass the smoke test, and uh, you know we checked some of the panel lighting and uh, basic elementary functions of the machine, we realized that is at the voltage level, not at the logical level. We, we determined that the core memory uh, sense and uh, data lines, our drive lines, have been completely rusted out. So uh, this is. This was supposed to be a sealed uh, by gasket container for the core memory. It had 20k of core, 20,000 words of core, and uh, is that right? Digits. Digits, Digits of, of core. And somehow water got in there. So once water's in there and it's sealed, it essentially sort of seals the thing in water. And uh, so we were very depressed about that because without the core, uh, we weren't really going to get very far at all. So Dave took us all to a Chinese restaurant, Mountain View, hang in, as it's known, and where we kind of commiserated, and uh, very quickly, within about 20 minutes, said, well, you know what, let's just build a semiconductor replacement for that core. And I played the devil's advocate and uh, said, well, be careful, because if we put too much, uh, if we add too many things to this machine, it becomes uh, like some strange wounded animal on life support. With all these extra wires attached to it, and, you know, at, at some point it stops being an IBM system twenty and it becomes a, a, a strange hybrid. Uh, so anyway, I, we knew we were on the right track when one of us 
actually me, got a fortune cookie that said, you have a magnetic personality uh, at that dinner. <laughs> so we looked at that as a sign that we should go ahead. And, this. Uh, and there's the board. I'm sorry, the pictures are a little fuzzy, but uh, there's the board. And the memory took up one, you know, the actual memory chip that we used, what we used about 1% of it. And then you have all this stuff supporting the memory chip for time and power supply. This is only a 20K digit uh, memory that we did. So, one of the neat things about the project was that it really shook the tree in terms of attracting people and objects to the museum. Uh, I don't mean anything derogatory but strange attractors. I just thought it was kind of a neat uh, concept. So as word of the project propagated, our film software and subject matter experts were attracted to the project. We especially hooked up with a guy called David Wise in Portland, Oregon, who had a 1620 running in his basement. And was able, <laughs> yeah, was able to give us uh, just a huge amount amounts of invaluable information on testing and prototyping uh, and, and level one diagnostics to check through the whole machine. So we actually flew him down for one weekend. And uh, uh, virtual volunteers, there were about 20 virtual volunteers who helped out. Uh, they built the, the Java simulator, this is the one. Or emulator, rather. A uh, professor at Purdue, John Maniotis, donated 300,000 punch cards to the project that came to about 50 megabytes or half a zip disk, but it took about four body cabinets, four punch card body cabinets for the software. And the group actually, then, because we were missing a card reader, we actually built a um, card reader emulator that plugs into a PC. So we digitize all the cards using a card reader, brought them into a PC, and then you could feed them back into the system. To this interface. And now, to see again why I kept saying how much, how much we made in reviewing this object, now we've got uh, fake core memory and a very impressive VME uh, based system of interfaces uh, for this machine. But nonetheless, we, we figured it was still 1620 at this point. Um, other things that the project attracted were a lot of photos, manuals, book software, memory spare parts, oral histories, and all these things. Are now part of the museum's permanent collection that we never had before. So that's what I mean by uh, the project attracting all these other things that we never really dreamed of would come. Why does 1620 project work? Well, passion is team. Uh, there were other machines that we could have chosen, machines that were maybe more, uh, more historically relevant or you know, home runs for IBM in the world of computing. Uh, but uh, most of the people there use the machine as, as youngsters or you know, people in their 20s. And so they were both skilled at its operation and had a deep emotional attachment to the machine. That's really, really important. I know everyone here really understands that in, when you select a machine to bring back to life. It's often your first machine or your favorite machine. You really have a lot of uh, uh, internal emotion bonded to that, to that object. Uh, strong and effective management was another really obvious feature of why this project worked. Dave Babcock was just an amazing uh, organizer and motivator of people. And uh, he would be just an excellent choice for any project, I think, because he's so, uh, he was so good at that. He really, got, he really got it in terms of you can't just start ripping stuff out and, and you know, you've got to move very deliberately and slowly. And as, as you all know, the slower you go, the higher your chances of success, no matter how uh, eager you are to go ahead. It's probably better if you just step back and take a deep breath and uh, it's basically troubleshooting philosophy, right? You can sort of go on a try a hunch and uh, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. It won't, but if you go and start uh, from first principles, you have a much higher likelihood of success. An institutional home, having a place where it, uh, which is the museum, which is uh, where the team could set up large power, it was a 208 volt, three phase power uh, place where their equipment, their oscilloscope, their spare parts, and so on, where they would be, this, this area that they worked in would be violet, they'd be left alone. Dave Wise was a Dutch uncle for us, uh, that is, he was a, a giver of sage advice. And again, the passion of this team, I put that in twice, because this was really, really important uh, in, in the project. You can see that that was the reason, it was something much deeper to the reason people spending their Saturdays on this machine. And uh, I wanted to also point out that with the institutional home, 
the worst worst based flying financial support in the museum, but they both they back pocket like she said, who's a German report museum, uh, personally put up uh, money to support the project. <coughs> so that was really important. Uh, you know, to have the weight of the museum behind you uh, saying this is a really good thing to do, to be doing and to know that your efforts will be will live will live on, hopefully much past your own uh, our own existence, although it's hard to say. It's a great argument that they were regulators, in fact, that they will last longer than physical hardware. Anyway, so I'll just wrap it up and say if you want to uh, donate hours or spirit, you know, on any museum activity or spirit and a reconstruction project, uh, it says sometimes in 2003, but you know, anytime, let's put that in because we're moving soon. So uh, I have just considered an open invitation right now. Uh, please be in touch. Possible candidate machines, that is, machines for which there's a strong uh, advocate. Uh, internally or otherwise, already. Yeah, I can afford to the one. Yeah, 51. Xerox Park, uh, Alton. We'd like to get a couple of Altos right. And who's here to do that? Maybe, sort of. <laughs> um, and Apple One, and IBM 43 and the one mainframe, which we have, which was running, it was decommissioned probably, uh, it decommissioned with it, with it running. And unit record equipment, uh, that was punch card equipment. We've got lots of that stuff that is very uh, interesting to watch in operation. It's very visceral and very physical. So if you do wish to volunteer, contact Betsy Tool or Lee Courtney. And uh, their email addresses are up there. So thanks again to everyone and Sam for putting on this uh, great vintage computer festival. And we'll just open up the questions. Any questions? Yes? How do we handle uh, objects that come with batteries that are corroded? Is that a good question? Yeah, well, bat things with batteries, the batteries get removed immediately and on the foundation. And uh, as you know, it's difficult. Some things have really have, uh, rechargeable batteries with really bizarre form factors, so we try to uh, you know, keep that in mind. But I mean, if, if the uh, batteries are gone, they're gone. There's no, no point. We photograph and document them, keep a record on, on the old battery pack. But Anything with batteries has batteries in the middle of the Any other questions? Yeah. How far along has the digitization effort uh, gone? Uh, oh, paper or? Paper or art in general? It's, it's pretty well in the early stages. And I think we're, uh, it's mainly a question of, uh, of manpower. So if you like scanning, we're going to play a song. We've got lots and lots of documents. And Eric Smith and Al Costa also do a lot of scanning and reading of bizarre media for us. Just one comment on that. We do have, you might want to say something about Sharon joining us and what she's going to we be just, doing. We have a new full time archivist who came on a couple weeks ago. And part of her mandate is to, uh, is to direct, this is to get all the documentation, first of all, and then index in order to we have you know, a mountain of documents that uh, are sort of in the Understood in bulk, but not in, in specific detail. So, so first is to find an index, and then a uh, scanning machine. I believe we ordered a very high frequent scanning machine. There are other alternatives too. You can uh, send um, documents away to sort of scan shops to get done. You know, usually in other countries, and uh, if you send hundreds of thousands of documents away and get a, get a CD back. Okay. Thanks very much.